Tonight, we're taking your questions regarding this fall and winter hunting seasons. We'll talk about chronic wasting disease in Arkansas's deer and elk population and how the Game and Fish Commission is going to respond. Duck and goose season, uh, season is just around the corner and we'll address the feral hog problem in our state. So get your questions ready. Outdoor Hotline starts right now. Outdoor Hotline is made possible in part by the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, AEGN's partner in conservation. Good evening and welcome to Outdoor Hotline. I'm Tony Brooks and with me a studio filled with Arkansas wildlife officers and biologists are here to take your questions. If you have any inquiries about hunting in Arkansas or you don't understand some of the rules and regulations, call us toll free at 1-800-662-2386 or you can email us at outdoors at AETN.org. Now let me introduce our first panel of experts. Mr. Jeff Crow is the director of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Brad Carner is the Chief of Wildlife Management with the Game and Fish Commission. Corey Gray is the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission Deer Program Coordinator. And Ralph Meeker is the Assistant Deer Program Coordinator. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us tonight. Jeff, I want to, I want to start with you. Uh, chronic wasting disease was, was detected in Arkansas fairly recently. It was. But, but the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission really began preparing for this possibility long before that first positive test came in. You know, Tony, that's, that's, that's correct. We, uh, you know, obviously wish we'd never had to experience this, but we knew that it was always a possibility. And, and I think a lot of those preparations has really served our agency well as we, uh, as we uh, try to address this uh, problem that, uh, that our, our staff has, has kind of thought some of these things through. Uh, probably that, that first plan that we put together is not being followed uh, it to, as it was originally drafted, but I think that is, this is an adaptive process that we're going through and we're learning from uh, the lessons that have been learned in the states, the 23 states that have detected it before us. So, uh, but that, those preparations were key in our response and we're, we're very grateful for our staff for all the work that they put into that. I think I've heard you say that this dealing with this is not a uh, sprint. It's a, it's going to be a marathon. That's right. You know, and, and I think that's important for our, for our sportsmen to understand and for our public to understand that that the the agency, the Game and Fish Commission, is is committed to the long haul. You know, this is as you said, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, and you know, we we have to respond to this disease uh, for from now on. And uh, and and I'm I'm very proud of what we've done up to this point, and I'm confident going forward that that that, that we're prepared to do that. Okay. We, we talked about CWD during a call-in program much like this back in May of this year, but I want to do some recapping. And Brad, chronic wasting disease is, is not caused by a virus or a bacteria like many wildlife diseases we're, we're accustomed to. Right. That's right. Uh, it, it is unlike most other diseases that we're familiar with. It, it, the infectious agent is a, a prion or a misshaped protein, um, and, and so that uh, prion is very resistant, uh, and as Jeff mentioned, uh, it, it's uh, once once we have it in the environment, it persists in the soil, and and unfortunately, we uh, know that it's unlikely that we'll ever eradicate it or eliminate it. Uh, our our goal is to try to manage it, contain it, slow the spread of it, and and prevent the introduction into new areas. But it it is unlike any other disease that that uh, you know, we're familiar with. And it's hard, if not impossible, to get rid of. I mean, bleach, you take the chemicals we generally would think would, would eradicate that, do not. Right, extreme temperatures, uh, enzymes, other things that would normally break down proteins uh, don't work on, on prions, unfortunately. So it, it, it does persist uh, indefinitely. Okay, I hear those phones ringing, we're getting calls, I'm gonna move on, but uh, one of, if not the major concern about CWD is, is how it's spread. And uh, what, what do we know at this point about how this disease is transmitted? Yeah, it appears it can be spread from animal to animal, direct contact. We know that it's been found in the saliva, feces, and the urine of these animals. So it can be spread through social grooming, but also indirectly through the environment. 
uh, you know, animals are shedding these, these, these infectious agents, these prions. And so if they're shedding it, say for example, on a salt lick, and then another animal comes in that's not infected, but it licks that salt lick, then it's picking up uh, those, those prions. And it could pick up an amount that would be infectious for that, that individual. Okay, I'm going to change gears here just a little bit. We've got, I know, more calls about CWD, but this uh, question came in. I'm curious to know the logic behind taking the private land to hunt and moving it from early October to the end of the month. Uh, this totally destroys the purpose of the private land to hunt. It was intended to provide a way for buck hunters to shoot a doe without interfering with buck hunting during muzzleloading a rifle season. Now muzzleloader season takes place in no man's land for uh, buck hunting in the middle of the month. Uh, while the doe hunt happens during the time of prime buck movement, uh, not a good move. That's from one of our viewers. Uh, and I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming they're referring to our, our private lands antlerless hunt. Um, that that hunt originally uh, was the first year it was implemented was uh, at the end of October, uh, and that's mainly due to how the calendar falls each year, uh, whether there's four weekends or five weekends in October. Uh, our muzzleloader season is set to open on the third Saturday in October each year and, and run through that fourth weekend. And so in years where we have five weekends in October, uh, we have an open weekend there that we can, can shift that antlerless only hunt to, to start then. Our intent and our goal with that hunt is to harvest more antlerless deer, more does. And, and if we're able to have that hunt, we have an open weekend uh, when deer are gonna be moving more and, and we can uh, have an increased harvest, uh, that would, you know, that, that's what we wanna do, is, is to harvest more does, which was the intent for that hunt. So, but that, that's why it falls where it does this year is because there are five weekends in, in the month of October okay. and we have an open weekend there. Gotcha. Okay, got another question here uh, regarding regulations. Am I allowed to archery hunt for deer with only the uh, $10.50 resident conservation license? Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That was, that was easy. Okay. <laughs> that was easy. Let's move on. Uh, back to CWD now. Uh, and we'll hear this question, I'm sure, a couple of times tonight. Is CWD dangerous uh, to humans? Can the meat from an infected animal be consumed? Yes, it can be. Uh, and, and, you know, from the research that we know of, uh, all the case studies that we've been following, uh, there's nothing that supports that chronic wasting disease is transmitted to humans. Um, what we're telling folks is if that deer looks fine, then by all means consume it. Uh, so, but on the, on the flip side, regardless of whether it has CWD or not, if that animal looks bad, don't consume that. Uh, we do have a 1-800 number that we'd like folks to call uh, if that, that deer is really poor looking. And I, uh, think we, we have we, some, I think we have some stills of, of deer that do have CWD so yeah. you kind of know what, well, what and to look for. Chronic wasting disease, you know, there, there are a lot of other diseases out there that have some of the same symptoms. Sure. So it's very difficult to take a look at that animal and say that one has CWD. Uh, but, you know, we, we are interested, especially in and around our CWD management zone, uh, that if someone does see a really sick or, or um, you know, a, a strange acting deer to give us a call at that 1-800 number uh, and we'd like to take a sample from it. Okay, Here, this is a, a related question came in. Is there any difference regarding uh, consumption of the animal if it is exhibiting symptoms or apparently has had the disease for some time? Uh, if they've got it, they've got it. If yeah. If it's more severe, is it more dangerous? Or? So, and that's another problem with CWD. That that prion can stay uh, in that animal for a long period of time before it ever causes that deer or elk to show symptoms. Uh, so, as long as that deer looks fine, then it's it's fine to consume to consume right. the meat. Uh, you know, we we suggest that we don't cut across the spinal cord, uh, don't cut into you know brain or or don't consume. Uh, lymphatic tissue or any kind of nervous tissue like that but if that deer looks fine by all means I'd consume it. We, we get this question a lot is is it dangerous to livestock CWD? No it's it's not ever been found to be transferred directly into a cattle uh, or any other livestock I mean there's different strains of these prions of course there's the the bovine form of it the mad cow disease that we're familiar with or scraping in sheep but far as this prion chronic wasting disease it's not been found to, to go cross species into another one. It, it affects only the members of the deer family, which yes, in, in Arkansas would be elk and, and whitetails. Okay. I got this question today uh, regarding, I know you, you, you guys have heard this, regarding pets. Say a dog 
might consume some deer meat where a deer's been field dressed. Is that a problem? Is that a danger? No, again, it, it would not cross species. Okay, and we, we showed that shot of a deer that, that has that had CWD. What, what are some of the outward symptoms? I mean, if, if someone's out there and they see a deer that they suspect, but they're not sure, what are, what are some of the things that they can look for that would probably indicate it might possibly be CWD? Yeah, some of the extreme clinical symptoms are, of course, uh, wide A-frame stance where the deer's trying to, to, to keep its uh, balance. It'll have its head low, neck out straight, ears will be low, and this excessive thick uh, salivation coming out of his mouth. I noticed in the, in the photo we, we show that, and you'll see that's been fairly common. We've seen several that standing in water where they're urinating and drinking at the same time, and that's, that's very odd. Um, so that's their fear of humans. Lose fear of humans. Right. They they may have a uh, kind of you know this this blank expression over their on their face. They're looking out of the top of their eyes at you. Uh, so some of these these symptoms is what we're noticing. Yeah. Uh, now as far as confirming for certain that a deer has CWD, there's there's really only one way to do that. Correct. That's right. That, the, the tests that we take, uh, we actually take some, uh, some of the, the, the brain stem and lymph nodes, and those have to be sent off to be tested. So uh, right now, we, we, the uh, Game and Fish, we don't recognize any type of reliable live test. Uh, the test that we use uh, that is our gold standard uh, is a test that has to be done on the animal after it's, after it's been harvested or it's died. I was going to ask you about that. I assume there is work being done on tests. To, 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 determine, to determine, excuse me, if an animal has CWD. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of other states, there's a lot of research going on uh, simultaneously with other states, um, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, trying to determine new tests, uh, both live and post-mortem tests on for CWD. Okay. Well, I want to go back to the that, that first confirmed case of CWD in Arkansas and ask you guys to tell me about that, and, and did the animal exhibit any symptoms or was this just a random test? Well, it, it was a, a random test from a, a hunter harvested elk there on the Buffalo National River. Uh, and so it was part of our routine surveillance that we've been doing uh, with our elk hunt since the first year of that in 1998. Um, Looking back as in, and in speaking with that hunter, uh, it was a, a lone cow elk that was by itself that came out into a field. And, and so looking back, it, it may have been starting to show some of the you know, initial symptoms of, of the disease, but uh, you know, it, it didn't uh, outwardly have a, a, a poor physical appearance or anything at that time, but it, it was just part of our routine surveillance where we picked it up. Uh, it wasn't a, a target animal or, or one that was uh, sampled because it, it appeared to be sick. Okay. Here's, here's a question we always get, and I know you guys get every day when you're out working. How did CWD get to Arkansas? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, I mean, I wish we did, but uh, we don't. I mean, and there's a lot, of, a lot of theories out there as to, you know, whether the elk brought it in and, and many other things, but we try to stay in the world of what we know. Um, and we, we try not to go into too many assumptions, uh, even though that world may be small that we live in, uh, but that's where we need to reside. Um, but, you know, again, going back to the elk, if it was or not, it, you know, 1981 to 1985 is when the elk were brought in. Uh, chronic wasting disease was not even identified in a wild population until 1981. So, so those individuals were doing things out of good faith. You know, it's, it's hard to cast stones from 2016 back to two th in 1981. The science just wasn't there. So we can't fault those individuals uh, if, if it was brought in. We, we're not certain. Now, the CWD has been confirmed in how many counties? And tell me about that area now. It, it's in five counties where, where it's been detected. And uh, I think we have a graphic of the, of yeah, the zone, maybe. That's New, most of them are Newton County, but also Boone, uh, Madison, uh, Carroll, and Pope uh, are the five counties. And then well, we we mapped the locations of all of, of, of those positive samples and, and created a 10-mile buffer around that, and, and, and that touched 10 counties. And we used those 10 counties as our CWD management zone. But it, Currently, it's just been found in, in those five counties. Now, is that an expanded area since it was first discovered? I mean, since that first 
positive test. Has that area grown to what we see now? Or? It, it has. As, as we've uh, done more sampling, uh, especially with our, our roadkill samples and, and some target or, or sick animals, it has expanded out into Carroll and Madison and, and, and Pope County. Uh, you know, those original detections were in, in Newton County. Uh, and, and as we uh, spent uh, 10 days, I believe it was in March, uh, sampling uh, fairly intensively, uh, we picked up a couple in, up into Boone County, but it, with with our sampling through the the late spring and the summer, it, it has uh, expanded in, into those other uh, neighboring counties. And I know you, you officers have have tested deer that that are killed by vehicles. Is that statewide, or is that just to kind of get an idea of where they are? Because definitely you can test that. Those, that those are statewide samples, and, that, and that's our strategy for disease detection. Uh, we found out uh, and we've learned that, that not all samples are the same, that you have a higher probability of detecting this, detecting the disease in roadkill animals and target animals. And we consider a target animal as any animal showing clinical symptoms. Uh, now for our surveillance, we'll look more at hunter harvested animals, but as far as finding the disease, you have better odds with, uh, in roadkills. Yeah. And as our director mentioned in our response plan, you know, it's this is truly adaptive. And so we're using several different mechanisms to collect samples. Uh, like Corey said, you know, some of these samples are, are a little bit more likely to give us that detection probability. Um, and so, um, you know, as we find more and more information, we're able to adapt our strategies. And that's going to help long term help us define those management practices and and help set regulations and what you want is people to have a to have a calm response to this i mean we don't want to panic here and uh, i've read articles where they say well it can be spread by scavengers you know crows and, and possums and that sort of thing i mean is that really a possibility i mean that well it, it can be i mean you minimize risk when you're talking about disease management we're talking about risk management and so uh, it's, it's about the risk that you're willing to withstand and what you can attempt to manage. And we understand that there's been some research about crows that, that could possibly uh, spread the virus or spread the prions, excuse me. But uh, we're not able to manage that risk. Right. And so we just try to try to stay in the world of what we can uh, manage and minimize. And that's and that's our regulations. OK, uh, I, I want to recap. Uh, we have a roll in. Uh, video piece here. I want to recap some of the topics that uh, we have discussed uh, within this segment regarding CWD. And this piece was produced by Trey Reed with uh, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. So if we could take a look at that, at that piece right now. White-tailed deer are one of the natural state's greatest wildlife success stories. Arkansas's deer harvest has grown from about 200 in 1938 to more than 200,000 in each of the past four seasons. And while the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and its conservation partners did much of the heavy lifting for whitetail restoration, it couldn't have happened without the state's deer hunters. Today, Arkansas's whitetail herd faces another big challenge. And once again, the Game and Fish Commission is calling on hunters to help. You just continue to hunt, continue to do your food plots and pay your leases and, and do all the deer camp things that you normally would. But just be, be aware that if you do come across a sick animal, notify us and, and let, us, let us sample that animal. Chronic wasting disease, or CWD, is a fatal neurological disease that affects elk, white-tailed deer, and other members of the deer family. The disease was detected earlier this year in an elk taken by a hunter near the Buffalo National River last October. Shortly after the positive elk sample was confirmed, a sample taken from a white-tailed deer near Ponca also revealed the disease. The Game and Fish Commission initiated its CWD response plan, creating a focal area in Newton County and randomly sampling whitetails to determine the extent of the disease. And we needed around 300 samples inside that focal area for statistical confidence. We were able to collect those samples in 10 days and we, the results came back with a 23% prevalence. Very high, a lot more than we expected. Over the next several months, Game and Fish collected roadkill deer in every Arkansas county to determine the geographical reach of CWD. Our staff have been collecting those all throughout the spring and the summer months, over 1,200 deer statewide, and we found the disease in five counties. I'm really impressed with the way Arkansas has been responding to chronic wasting disease. It's a measured, 
uh, response. It's recognizing that this is a marathon disease. It's, it's a very thoughtful and um, well-informed response that Arkansas is using to addressing chronic wasting disease. So this next phase that'll come up for this upcoming deer season is going to continue to monitor the prevalence in our focal areas, but we're also going to try to fine tune the spatial distribution. Can we shrink that up as much as we can and draw a definite hard line around where this disease at, is at in our state? Hunters can assist in the effort by voluntarily taking their deer to one of the more than two dozen check stations that Game and Fish will set up during the opening weekend of modern gun deer season in the 10-county CWD management zone. Our goal is to collect 300 samples per each county in the CWD management zone. The second is inside the focal areas, the Newton County focal area and then the Pope County focal area. We want to collect 300 samples inside each one of those to monitor prevalence. With the onset of increased deer activity and seasonal movement in the coming weeks and months, Game and Fish will conduct additional CWD surveillance to try to detect any potential movement of the disease outside of the CWD zone. And that'll be statewide. That's the scale of, of that sampling in that we want to see if that disease can be found anywhere else. And the best strategy for disease detection is through roadkill animals and through target animals. And we consider a target animal any sick or unusual uh, white tail that's showing clinical symptoms of being ill. In addition to informing wildlife officials about any sick looking deer, hunters also can help by taking additional precautions after harvesting a deer. You ought to be more sensitive about how you process your game now. Uh, try to debone as much as you can. Be sensitive about where you move the carcass around to. We did not regulate carcass disposal, but we have uh, best management practices as to what you do with the, the, the carcass of the animal you just harvested. Hunters also can help by becoming familiar with new hunting regulations, including restrictions on baiting and feeding in the CWD management zone and prohibitions on moving harvested deer outside of the zone. Two goals associated with, with chronic wasting disease management. And one of them is to minimize the, the spread of the disease. We want to contain it inside the, the management area. And then also the second goal is to minimize the amplification of the disease. Is, is do not amplify it in those already established areas. So when you start talking about either the baiting and feeding or the antler restrictions or whatever the, the rule is, the carcass movement uh, regulation, each one of those is directly tied back to one of those two primary goals. The popular three-point rule for bucks also has been removed in deer zones one and two. When you look at the move, removal of the three-point rule, that's been one of the most popular regulations we've ever implemented with deer management. But when we look at uh, our sampling in that management area, 43% of our two and a half and, and older bucks were positive with this disease. So if 43% of your male segment has the disease, you do not want to protect those individuals. So that goes back to amplifying the disease. You don't want to amplify it. You want those individuals removed from the population. Although there's no evidence that CWD can infect humans, the Federal Centers for Disease Control and the Arkansas Department of Health say people shouldn't consume meat from an animal that's CWD positive. Hunters should also avoid harvesting sick looking animals. But if that animal is walking around uh, alert, uh, performing normal daily activities of, of feeding, then harvest that animal, process it, and enjoy it, and, and continue to deer hunt. In other states where CWD is present, hunting license sales often have declined in the immediate aftermath of detection, but they typically rebound in short order, as was the case in Colorado after CWD expanded to the state's western slope in the early 2000s. There was a big buzz about CWD in, in Colorado. Lots of talk, and I heard that there were reduced license sales. In my business or, or my peer group, I really never saw anybody that quit hunting. Heard about it. Um, I can't say that it ever affected my business. I've been hunting in Colorado since 1992. At this stage, it doesn't even enter my mind to tell you the truth. Me personally, um, after going through all the data, all the science, I don't have a problem with killing a deer and eating it. We may experience that in that we may have that shrinking back on hunting license sales, especially in those deer zones uh, that are impacted. But we feel like though that hunters will, will, will start realizing that this disease is something that we can live with. CWD experts say the most important message is that management of CWD is a long-term endeavor that calls for a measured response.
I think it's extremely important that we manage chronic wasting disease, but we have to do it with realistic expectations. And the expectation at this point is not eradication. It's limiting the prevalence of the disease and trying to control the, the spread so it doesn't continue to spread to a larger area. We need to continue at a slow, steady pace because this disease is not going to be eradicated. It's going to be something that we're going to live with for, for future years. So I hope uh, hunters, hunters understand that in that uh, it's going to be something that we're going to talk about from now on. Joining our panel now, let's welcome Colonel Pat Fitz, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission Chief of Enforcement. Colonel, thanks for, for being here with us. What regulation changes since CWD do you think hunters are most likely to, to notice? I mean, what, what's, what's the, those that are out there they're going to notice first? Tony, the first thing we tried to do is, is similar to our importation ban on carcasses uh, around the state is develop that same concept around the, the 10 county uh, management zone. So you will not be able to take a deer outside of that area without deboning the meat uh, with skull plates cleaned with no meat on them, uh, things of that nature to, to try to eliminate uh, where we know we have the disease, try to eliminate its spreading. Uh, some other regulation changes is the removal of the three-point rule. Uh, we also will be uh, adding their uh, um, a button head will not count towards their buck limit. Uh, it will just be tagged and checked as an antlerless deer. Okay. Uh, you talked about the workshops. You guys are conducting workshops to teach methods of processing deer. Tell, tell me about those and when, where? So uh, we're going to have four. Um, uh, actually, one of them is tonight in Centerton. Uh, the other three will be on October the 8th. Uh, one will be at uh, in Yaleville, Yaleville at Fredbury Conservation Center. One will be at the Ponca Elk Education Center. One will be in Russellville. But they can go on our Game and Fish website and find the exact locations and times for those on agfc.com. And it's to help show folks how to how to comply with that carcass uh, um, exportation rule. You know, being able to debone, skin their deer, help process it. To to a certain point in the field uh, to help keep some of that infectious agent from leaving the CWD zone. Okay. We had some, some calling questions here. Now, how far south is the CWD zone in Arkansas? It, it goes south of the river there in, uh, what does that be, Yale in and, Logan, and County. Logan counties. Uh, the, our, our, the southernmost positive sample we found is, is at London. Uh, right there at the nuclear power plant on Highway 333. It was a roadkill buck, two and a half year old buck, and uh, it, it was positive. So we were able to collect some samples in that area this summer and not found any additional positive animals uh, in that area, but we're going to continue monitoring, especially this upcoming season. Okay. Again, some more regulation questions. If I see an elk outside the elk zone, can I take the elk while I'm deer hunting? Yes, you can. Uh, part, part of that regulation package that, that we just spoke about uh, was the creation of a, a five-county core elk zone, uh, which is uh, Boone, Newton, Carroll, uh, Madison, and Searcy counties. Uh, and, and our season there remained largely unchanged, our elk season. But for the other uh, 70 counties in the state, uh, if, if a hunter sees an elk during any open deer season, it is legal to take that elk with, with whatever weapon uh, is legal for deer hunting at that time. Uh, and, and we have already had at least two uh, bull elk harvested uh, in Pope County, uh, which is out, outside of that core zone. And so the intent with that was to try to um, uh, we know that our elk population was starting to slowly expand uh, and knowing that we do have CWD within our elk herd, we wanted to eliminate any animals that are, were starting to expand outside of that core area and, and minimize the, the risk of spreading the disease. So if, if a hunter sees an elk uh, during an open elk season, uh, during an open deer season outside of the core elk zone, uh, it, it's fair game. Okay. Uh, they, they do have to call, report it. Uh, it is mandatory that we take a CWD test from any elk harvested. Okay. Here's a, a question from White County. How close to a residence can you hunt? On, uh, on land that adjoins private property, if you're leasing that property, 
you cannot get closer with a firearm than 150 yards. For archery, 50 yards. Okay. Uh, th this is one that you covered earlier, but uh, what does lifting the three-point rule uh, do in regard to help with CWD? So uh, some of the information that we collected uh, when we were um, first collecting CWD samples there in Newton County, uh, what we did find was a, a high prevalence rate in some of our younger bucks. And what the three-point rule is designed to do is to protect young bucks to allow them to get to older age classes. And so if you remember back, part one of our goal is to minimize that prevalence of CWD. So there's really no sense of protecting those younger bucks especially if, if you have a high prevalence rate of CWD. Uh, so we, we want to try to remove those animals from the landscape so that we're not increasing the amount of CWD that we have on the landscape. And it also helps out with spatial distribution of the disease. I mean, those young bucks right. are known to disperse. And so if you're trying to shrink that disease up or trying to contain it, then those animals that, that tend to make those jaunts, then you want to eliminate them. Yeah. Uh, and so th it, there's a two-pronged strategy to that, to that regulation. It, it's important to point out that the three-point rule was r removed only from deer zones one and two. So yeah. on, only those two zones. Uh, the other zones across the state were, were unaffected. So that, that's an, an important point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this question after we talked about the, the deboning workshops, what do I do to indicate proof of sex on a deboned deer after you clean it? At, at that point, the deer has been has been tagged and checked. Okay. So, okay. so, so they're good to go. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a question to all of you, uh, and we've, we've kind of covered that here, but the most effective weapon that, that, that you guys have in combating CWD are Arkansas hunters. So if we had to give some advice to hunters how they can help you, what are some of the the main things you would suggest, all of you? That, that's a very important point. I mean, we can only do so much. Our, our planning, our development of regulations, uh, our sampling plans, really with, without hunters, hunters are the ones to actually implement our management plan. We, we need uh, our Kansans to continue to deer hunt especially within the CWD management zone. We need to continue to harvest deer and, and try to control deer densities and help slow the spread. It's also very important that hunters realize how important it is within that zone uh, not, not to, to take uh, those parts of the animals out of that zone where the prions are going to exist. Uh, and so we realize it's an inconvenience to hunters within that zone and it takes effort, extra effort on their part to debone that animal, to cape that buck out before they bring it out, but that is extremely important. So the, the hunters, at this point, we, we have done all that we can do, and now it's we, we're relying on the hunters to actually implement that management strategy. So it, it's critical, uh, their role, uh, going into this deer season. Yeah, not only are they allowing us to help manage deer densities, but also collect information. Um, uh, because without that information, it, that's what's gonna help us move forward. And so this coming deer season, the open weekend and modern gun deer season, we're gonna be setting up 25 CWD collection stations within the CWD management zone. Uh, so hunters that are that harvest a, a deer that opening weekend, and we may end up doing it that second weekend of modern gun deer season as well, but uh, we, we'd urge them to look in our, in our, uh, in our guidebook on page eight. Uh, it has a listing of all those 25 stations. Uh, and we to ask folks to bring us their deer, whether they think it has CWD or not, uh, that that information is going to help us into the future. Um, you know, devise those those management regulations. Okay, and, and back to the uh, three-point rule. Uh, we want to clarify that's only in, in zones one and two. Deer zones one and two is, is where the the antler restrictions, the three-point rule was dropped. Okay. Deer zones one and two. Okay. Uh, what if a person, hunter or non-hunter, sees an animal that they suspect? Uh, may have the disease, and I know this is something that you guys want to know. Uh, how can they get that information to you? We've, uh, we, we've got our dispatch center, which is 24-7. We have a live dispatcher there, 1-800-482-9262. Uh, they can make the call there, and the dispatcher will get somebody in touch with them on the location of the deer. Okay. We, we've talked about several things that hunters can do, and in, in, in just kind of wrapping that up, what can what precautions can hunters take in helping you guys prevent the spread of CWD? 
Well, the, the, the biggest thing we ask them to do is, is come familiar with our regulations. Uh, be knowledgeable about them and then follow them. But also, again, November the 12th and the 13th, that opening Saturday and Sunday, uh, modern gun season. If you're in one of these 10 counties, bring your harvested animal to us. We'll, we'll pull a sample, we'll test your animal for free, and then you'll be given a, a business card to, to check back on the results. Uh, we're also working with veterinarians. We have 67 veterinarians scattered throughout the state that have agreed to uh, work with hunters to collect samples, and we're currently uh, gathering names of taxidermists uh, that have agreed uh, to work with us and pull samples for hunters. And so we're trying to make a multi-pronged approach there on, on, on means and avenues for hunters to, to gather samples. And, and even though this has not been shown to affect humans, uh, there are precautions that a hunter can take in, in cleaning a deer after. What, what are some things they can do just to be on the safe side? Yeah, uh, you know, like Ralph was talking about earlier, debone the animal, don't cut through the spinal column, minimize any contact that you have you know inside the brain cavity in any of the central nervous system uh, clean up your equipment wear gloves when you process these animals but use a bleach solution a 40 percent bleach solution on your equipment uh, and then dispose of the remains properly we've also listed on our agfc.com as a list of approved landfills in the state that will accept deer carcasses but also the the next best route is just bury it on on your own property or leave it uh, in the area that you harvest if you're hunting pr uh, public lands just leave those entrails and remains right there on that wma and don't transport them across the state okay one, one other thing i think it's important to, as a reminder uh, knowing that there's elk seasons underway in, in other states and it, it's a good reminder to our hunters that are going to other states that, that we have those carcass importation restrictions in place and so everything that comes back into the state should be deboned before it comes in, uh, cleaned antler skull plates, et cetera. We've had that regulation in place since 2012 and as, knowing that 23 other states are CWD positive, there there is a, a very good likelihood that uh, you know, hunters are harvesting CWD positive animals in other states, and, and we certainly don't want to introduce it into a new area of the state where it where it's, doesn't currently exist. So, a, a good reminder to any hunter going out of state is to to go through those precautionary required steps before they bring those animals back in. And again, for for a complete list of the regulations, you can go to your website. Go to our website. Uh, our licensed dealers uh, have copies of our guidebooks. Uh, and, and every county has at least two wildlife officers assigned to that county. Uh, we can go through the dispatcher to have them call you back. If you have questions, reach out before you go hunt. Okay, very good advice. Uh, here's a question about deer feeders. Uh, there was some talk about limiting the use of deer feeders. Where do we stand on that now? So um, within the CWD management zone, within those 10 counties, um, the, the regulation says that it, you can bait uh, hunt over bait from September 1st to December 31st, uh, but there's no uh, incidental feeding of wildlife or, or of deer. So you can't just place corn out to, to watch wildlife. Uh, you have to be hunting over it and, it, and it can only occur between September the 1st and December 31st. Uh, and the reason we went to the September 1st is because we have some urban deer hunts that occur prior to our, to our statewide archery season, and that will allow them to bait um, at the very beginning of September. Okay. And it's important to point out, as, as Ralph said, that that just applies to those 10 counties within the CWD management zone. For the other 65 counties, there were no changes made to baiting or feeding regulations for, for 65 of the counties in the state. Okay. Uh, we may be repeating here, I think we touched on this earlier, what if, if I want to have my deer elk uh, that I've harvested tested for CWD where can I go and how long does it take to, to get the results of that test? Yeah, if you harvest it at opening weekend and you're in one of those 10 counties, uh, then bring it to one of the check stations that's listed on page 8 of the hunting guidebook. Also check on agfc.com. Uh, hopefully this week or next we'll have the list of uh, uh, participating veterinarians posted on our website. Or talk to your uh, taxidermist. Uh, we're working with several taxidermists in the state and, and those individuals will be collecting samples as well. Good. Uh, talk about people who harvest a deer and then maybe they take it to a place and have it processed. Are there any precautions that you're advising people who do commercial processing precautions they should take? 
Um, we have uh, been in, in uh, coordination and contact with processors, especially either within or in close proximity to our CWD management zone and, and uh, have gone over and discussed our, our regulations uh, with them, uh, have provided recommendations uh, to them about how to dispose of carcasses uh, from their facilities. Uh, and, and so we, we have been in, in, in contact with processors and, and mainly have just provided some general guidance and recommendations on, on how to, to deal with the carcasses once they're brought to them. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to return for more of your questions in a moment, but first we're going to take a look at this uh, piece on waterfowl hunting in Arkansas. When it comes to duck hunting, it's hard to find a better place to pitch your decoys than right here in the natural state. It's known throughout the world. Sometimes I don't think we really realize how it's viewed by people outside of Arkansas. I don't think you can hardly argue this is one of the most famous and well-known places to hunt ducks in, in the world. It is everything that people say it is. I mean, it is that good. Nearly 100,000 people bought Arkansas duck stamps last season, including more than 45,000 out-of-state hunters. Although the natural state ranked second behind California in total duck harvest, the state once again led the nation in mallard harvest with more than half a million more than twice the total of any other state. It's really about the geography of it all and the rivers coming together. Uh, we talk about the bottom of the funnel uh, for mallards coming down through the Mississippi Flyway. The success of Arkansas hunters depends greatly on duck production in the northern U.S. and Canada. And last year featured the highest estimate of duck abundance since surveys began in the 1930s. This year's counts were down slightly from last year, but the estimated population of 48.4 million is still nearly 40% above the long-term average. Even better news for Arkansas hunters is that this year's mallard count was a record 11.8 million, some 51% higher than the long-term average. But duck production isn't the only factor that affects hunting success in the natural state. Environmental factors such as precipitation and temperature determine the timing of migration and duck abundance throughout the central and Mississippi flyways. Last year, for example, featured the warmest and wettest December in the 151-year history of weather records for the lower 48 states. And Arkansas waterfowl surveys showed lackluster population estimates throughout the season. But despite last year's unusual and at times disappointing season, Arkansas hunters are still counting the days until duck season opens November 19th. And joining our panel now is Luke Naylor, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's Waterfowl Program Coordinator. Luke, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. Uh, like deer hunting, duck and waterfowl hunting in Arkansas is, is a big deal, a way of life for many families. Any major changes in 2016 for the rules and regulations regarding duck hunting? Fairly similar. A uh, couple regulation changes on wildlife management areas. Uh, there'll be a, uh, folks need to get out of the WMAs by noon this year as opposed to one in, in recent years. Um, and, and check your guidebook, look for those regulations, and, and look for notes about uh, restrictions on the types of decoys you can also use on wildlife management areas. O other than that, by and large, it's kind of the same old uh, way and do of business. You know, not a lot has changed. Any projections on what kind of duck season we can expect? Uh, yeah, a lot, to, lot can change between now and, and November or, or mid-December, but, you know, duck populations are great again. We've been riding this high of high duck populations for a lot of years now. Um, you know, we're record, record mallard populations, again, 11.8 million mallards, and typically, you know, all the, all the uncertainties about weather between here and, and, and where they are now, uh, you know, you, all that kind of washes out eventually, I think. In most years, if there's a lot of ducks in the breeding population, Arkansas hunters typically do real well. Okay. Uh, got a question here. Why did the Game and Fish Commission not begin capturing water uh, at the first of the month at the Hurricane Lake Wildlife Management Area as it has done in previous years? And I know that's, you guys have, I think, have a meeting scheduled to talk about that very topic. We do. I believe it's October 27th, correct? October 25th. 25th, sorry. October 25th, October 25th. Uh, at the Searcy High School I think, we have a graphic, I think we have a graphic on that, if we could bring that up. Yeah. About yeah. The, 
the changes in the wildlife management. Uh, yeah, well, water. it's one of the, we've been taking a look at all of our bottom and hardwood forests, uh, GTRs, uh, duckwoods, people, whatever name the, you call them. Uh, a lot of flooded bottom and hardwood forests. And, and Hurricane is a place where we've had a, a lot of concerns. Our, our managers on the ground there and our foresters have taken a hard look at this over the years. And we've had about four consecutive years where those, that, that place has been flooded almost year round, uh, and particularly in the summer. So it's per, it had this persistent growing season flooding for a period of years. And, and a lot of our folks who've worked at the agency longer than I have tell us that this looks a whole lot like things looked at Dave Donaldson Black River Wildlife Management Area uh, well over a decade before that when all of a sudden it stayed wet for several summers in a row and then one summer all of a sudden leaf out everything died and that was it uh, we're kind of concerned that we may be going down the same path that, that Henry Gray Hurricane Lake so to protect our timber basically. yeah we're trying to give it a, even a even a little bit of a drying period is better than nothing. We think. Okay, we get some questions in now about uh, duck hunting. Uh, this uh, doesn't say what county, but uh, how do they know how many ducks are killed in each year? Yeah, that's a survey conducted by our partners in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's the Harvest Information Program. Uh, that it's not the questions you answer when you go buy your license. That's part of it, but that is not the survey. Uh, that that information you provide. Or did I shoot no ducks, one to ten ducks, more than ten ducks? That helps the service essentially select who they're gonna who they're gonna actually send out real surveys to. Uh, and folks right now should be getting these diary surveys where the service is act asking folks to complete a diary of all their hunts throughout the hunting season and submit that back to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And those those numbers are what are actually used to generate duck harvest estimates. I have a question here. Uh, this may be for both of you. Why, why no guides uh, for waterfowl on wildlife management areas, but guiding for deer there is okay. Well, there's there's the elimination of the guiding on on the WMAs for waterfowl is because of crowding issues. Certainly, we don't want to have uh, competition for holes. We we have plenty of that without a guide being involved there. But this, this is an ongoing problem. We have, uh, we have cases we work every year on WMAs with this. Okay. Well, getting back to the, to the uh, CWD, use of uh, surrogate urine, uh, why has the Game and Fish Commission banned the use of uh, deer, urine, or deer urine? This is, uh, this is a beer from Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, so many states are, are looking at this, this regulations, but uh, we know that CWD, the prion, can be found in urine, and then this, the urine that you're buying or purchasing it, it, it on the, in the stores, they're, they're, that urine is collected from uh, captive servid uh, facilities where these deer are standing in a great system and they're urinating and, and defecating and salivating and it's all going in a, in a funnel, and then we purchase it. So uh, it's risk. And so we're trying to minimize, again, the risk of CWD being spread to other parts of our state. And so our commission did approve that regulation. It is not going to effect until January 1st, 2016, or 2017, excuse me. So if you currently have that, you can continue to use it. But then after January 1st, it will, you cannot use it while hunting or scouting. Okay. Uh, question here from Franklin County. What do I do if I kill a deer in a non-CWD zone? And have to travel through a CWD zone to get home. That's fine. You can you can do that. There's there's no restriction there. It's just animals coming out of the zone uh, that we restrict. Okay. Uh, I want to switch gears for just a just a minute here and talk about a, a problem many are calling a epidemic regarding Arkansas's worst invasive pest, the feral hog. And uh, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, feral hog damages in the U.S. total. $1.5 billion annually, more than $300 million in damages to row crops, pasture land, and other agriculture. And anyone who's ever been to an area of hunting where there, there are feral hogs, you can see the damage. It looks like somebody's had a backhoe in there. So uh, what is the origin of, of feral hogs in Arkansas? We've, we've had uh, feral hogs, uh, especially in South Arkansas, for, for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, it's important to point out that, that feral hogs are, are not wildlife. Uh, you know, they escape 
domestic animals. They're, they're actually state law uh, defines them as simply as a, a public nuisance. Um, and so the, the, the important point is that they're not wildlife. Uh, we, we have seen in recent years uh, kind of an explosion of, of the distribution uh, and just the number of hogs across the state and, and really a lot of that was uh, associated with as the, the, the popularity of the recreational hunting of hogs, the illegal transport and movement and release of, of hogs into to other areas uh, became an issue and, and so uh, for us on, on the in trying to manage them on our public lands around the state, uh, we, we realized that, uh, you know, the, the recreational uh, hunting of hogs kind of became a problem with, with the spread and rapid expansion of, of hog numbers on, on our public lands. Going back and forth here, we've got to call it, what if, what if I shoot a deer in the CWD zone and want to have it mounted by a taxidermist? You can. I mean, you, you can either cape it out yourself. Uh, and then take uh, the parts, the clean skull cap, the hide, uh, things like that, then to your taxidermist outside the zone. Or you can work with your taxidermist inside the CWD management zone and, and uh, then all is well. You can take a whole entire animal. As long as you stay within that zone, then the restrictions does not apply to you. Okay. Uh, this viewer wants to know about any uh, programs to help private landowners with habitat management. We do. Uh, we have a whole army of biologists called private land biologists, and, and they do nothing more than work with private landowners. And so what I, that individual, I would encourage them to either go visit our website, agfc.com, and, uh, and, and look uh, for information on a private land biologist, or call Little Rock or one of our regional offices and, and find the biologist that's assigned to their county. Okay. There's a question going back to, to feral hogs. Uh, the, the Russian boars that were brought into the U.S. in the early 20s, are, are we seeing those hogs breed with feral hogs in Arkansas? Are we seeing that that kind of a crossbreed of feral hogs? But there's kind of a, a mix of, of most everything out there, you know, everything from, you know, just domestic hogs that had, had been bought at sale barns and, and released into the wild, and then uh, uh, a mix of, you know, with Russian boar and other other uh, strains. So it, it's just a, all across the spectrum there. Okay. Here's a, here's a follow-up to the answer we just gave. If I kill a buck in a CWD zone, but my taxidermist is in a non-CWD zone, can I take the caped head to them? Yes, yeah, as long as it's caped out or in clean skull plate. Uh, and what we're recommending is if your taxidermist is outside the zone, but you're, you're hunting inside the zone, then have your taxidermist help you get out. Uh, taxidermists in Arkansas are networked together. And so you may go visit a taxidermist inside the zone just to cape your animal out and get it ready to, to transport outside. So, so utilize all those necessary resources. Okay. Uh, this is from Sharp County, Pat. This probably goes to you. What, uh, this gentleman wants to know what he can do, uh, the regulations about using dogs to hunt on his land? Uh, he can, as far as running for small game, he can he can do that as well. And and what what zone is that? Is he in Sharp County? Sharp County. Would be Deer Zone 3, uh, which would be no no dogs in, in Deer Zone 3 for deer, for deer hunting. Yes. Okay. I, I know that the feral hog problem is, is I guess maybe even worse in Texas than it is in Arkansas. And I know in, in Texas they're devising ways where they're using uh, uh, sodium nitrate to, to feed to, to feral pigs to, to rid them. Is that something we're looking at in Arkansas? There's the, the USDA uh, it is really uh, doing a lot of research looking at toxicants uh, as, as a means to control feral hogs and, and sodium nitrite is, is one of those that's being uh, investigated. They're really trying to fine tune the, the delivery of that so that you don't have uh, unintended species that are consuming it and then you know being uh, killed by it. So uh, the USDA really is the one that's leading a lot of the research and, and we're all hopeful that it, at some point in the foreseeable future that there will be an approved toxicant that can be used to control feral hogs. But for the meantime, uh, we have 
adapted our approach that that we're using a uh, large corral traps and trying to uh, trap uh, an entire group at once, an entire sounder of, of hogs. Um, and we feel and we've learned from experience that that's a, a far more effective way than than the original box traps where you might catch two or three at a time or, or e even hunting them where you might shoot one or two and the the rest of the group is is scattered and dispersed and moves on to other areas and so it we've learned that a more effective means is is trapping the entire group at once uh, and then moving on to the next group what if, what if a private landowner wants to trap pair of hogs on their property can they turn to you guys for assistance they can. Uh, we're also working uh, in, in coordination with uh, the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services, uh, county conservation districts, uh, and the NRCS uh, in, in trying to, to help counties through their conservation districts to provide traps and the means for private landowners to control them on their property. Again, using that trapping approach of trapping the entire group uh, but we, you, they can either contact us, uh, we can uh, help, help put them in contact with uh, county conservation districts, but uh, we, we are reaching out and trying to expand uh, our footprint in, in helping on private lands because we know so much of the state is privately owned and, and, and we've got to figure out a, an effective control measure on, on private lands as well. And it is illegal to transport a... Uh, it, it's feral illegal hog. to possess or transport uh, a live feral hog in the state. That's a state law, uh, been in effect since 2013, I believe. We're about to run out of time. Any, any closing comments you'd like to make as we wrap up tonight? I mean, we've covered a lot of territory. We've had some good questions. Uh, any closing remarks, anything you really want to drive home tonight? Really the only thing I would end with uh, related to CWD is, uh, again, stress how important it is. Uh, for our hunters to continue to get out there and hunt, enjoy the outdoors. Uh, we, we need hunters to, to harvest deer uh, and help us to implement our, our management plans, uh, help us uh, uh, to manage the disease. Uh, CWD, we want to uh, encourage everyone that it's, it's not a death sentence. You know, we, we're still going to have uh, deer hunting in Arkansas and, and, and that long tradition that we have. And so just get out and enjoy, enjoy the outdoors this fall. We're out of time. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. And we want to thank all of you who submitted questions. And we hope you all have a safe hunting season. Good night. is made possible in part by the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, AEGN's partner in conservation.